Friends, good morning. It's really good to have you with us for our online service today. We're going to be continuing on with our series exploring Micah 6 verse 8. If you weren't with us last week or the week before, you can catch the messages via our website and catch up on everything else we've been doing with the series so far. But as we begin together this morning, let's pray. And so gracious God, in these moments, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would come and move amongst us that you would draw us closer together and closer to you. Help us and encourage us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's sing together.
Hi everyone, uh, let's have a time of prayer together. Father, we thank you for the week that has been, for opportunities to share time with family and friends, for the good weather and the chance to get outside and enjoy our gardens, beaches and parks. But Father, we are aware that for some folk, they are unable to do so. For those who are ill or anxious, for those who are grieving the loss of someone close, Father, we pray that you will draw near to them. Be the comfort they need at this time. Father, we pray for your intervention around the globe, where ongoing conflicts bring so much pain and destruction. We lift up the people of Sudan, Afghanistan, Yemen and Ethiopia. We pray for wisdom for their leaders and decision makers. Father, you are the God of restoration. Bring peace, we pray. And we pray for our own country and our leaders. As restrictions ease, we pray for our chief scientists and our government with the pressures that they face. Help them to make good decisions that benefit everyone, not the few. Help us to make good decisions too and to consider the needs of others before ourselves. We pray for our church as organisations and activities start up again. There have already been so many positives as folk meet together again for Bible studies, services, youth work, we thank you that it feels like church again and we pray for energy and enthusiasm for our leaders and volunteers and, it, and for a desire for our community to join this faith journey with us. And Father, we pray for those who weigh heavy on our hearts and minds, those folks who need your presence. Father, if we can help in any way, make that known to us and prompt us to take action. Whether that is a visit, a phone call or a card popped through the door. Father, you are the God of unity. Be with our church, we pray. And Father, we lift up our own concerns and needs. Father, you are the God who provides. Help us to live in this reality. You only want the best for us. May we seek you in all that we do, to live by the example of Jesus, through the guidance of your Holy Spirit, and for your glory. Amen. Jesus, light the way by the 
Today's first reading is taken from Isaiah 63, verses 7 to 9. Praise and prayer. I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me. And so he became their saviour. In all their distress, he was too distressed and the angel of the presence saved them. In his love and mercy he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Today's second reading is taken from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged and I will pay everything back. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you, unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart.
He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The verse is Micah 6, verse 8, and that's the foundation text for our current Sunday series. Today is the third in our four-week look at Micah 6. And we come to the second thing that Micah tells us God requires of God's people. That God requires that you and me love mercy. Last week, Anne spoke powerfully about our call to be a people of justice, to be people who act justly. The call comes to us as God's people to do more than just tend the victims of injustice. But in the words of Desmond Tutu, there comes a point where we need to stop pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. Or to quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we're not simply to bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. God requires us to act justly and to take the justice of God's kingdom seriously. And God requires us to love mercy. And so as we dig into that this morning, let's pray. And so gracious God, in these moments, may the words of my mouth and the reflections of our hearts and minds together in this moment be found pleasing in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think mercy is in some ways harder to pin down and understand than justice or humility. We know what it is, but how would you describe it? Some translations uh, talk about loving kindness rather than loving mercy here, and that's good and helpful, I think. But mercy also takes in compassion and benevolence and forgiveness and grace and faithfulness as well as kindness. I do think most of us know mercy when we see it. If we can't reach for a neat definition of it, um, we still have a sense of what it is. And we know when we don't see it, when there's a lack of mercy, when someone or something is unmerciful. It can be sad, it can be perplexing, it can be outraging. It's also deeply unsettling. We hope we'd find mercy in others. We trust in the mercy we find in God. Now, one person who's done uh, much to increase the amount the global church talks about mercy over recent years is the Pope, who in 2016 had a book published called The Name of God is Mercy. It's a conversation he has with Andrea Tornielli, and in it we read how in the second sermon uh, he gives after becoming Pope, Pope Francis spoke spontaneously saying, the message of Jesus is mercy. For me, it is the Lord's strongest message. And he went on to talk about John chapter 8 and the woman caught in adultery and the men gathering to stone her. And Pope Francis says, sometimes we too like to reproach others, to condemn others, but Jesus comes for us when we recognise that we are sinners. The first and only step required to experience mercy is to acknowledge our need of it. Pope Francis spoke and still speaks about a church that doesn't reproach people for their fragility and their wounds, but rather a church that treats them with the medicine of mercy. And so in July 2013, he said that ours was a time for mercy. And when asked to explain a bit more about that, he said, yes, I believe this is a time for mercy, for the church to show her maternal side to a humanity that is so wounded. She doesn't wait for the wounded to knock on her doors, she looks for them on the streets, she gathers them in, she embraces them, she takes care of them, she makes them feel loved. Friend, mercy tells us that there are no situations we cannot get out of, that we're not condemned to sink in the quicksand of life. Jesus said he came not for those who were good, but for the sinners. 
He didn't come for the healthy who don't need a doctor, but for the sick. Mercy is the first attribute of God. It's God's ID card. Given that, it isn't surprising that Jesus is the very best example of how to live a merciful life that the world has ever known. His life was shot through with mercy in ways that changed the lives of those around him and changed the course of all history. Jesus' mercy and kindness and compassion set him apart and drew people to God. Now, it wasn't about denying the truth of sin and struggle. Mercy doesn't erase all that. God's forgiveness deals with sins. But in his mercy, Jesus does more than offer forgiveness. He sets people on the right path too. He invites them to live in a way where they will experience life in all its fullness. And so he says to the woman in John chapter 8 that she should go and sin no more. He defends sinners from their enemies and from any just condemnation to be faced in the future. In the parable that we have as our New Testament reading this morning, we come across a story where there is a distinct lack of mercy. It's not a parable where we have to work too hard to get the drift of what Jesus is talking about. Every time you accuse someone, you accuse yourself. Every time you forgive someone else, though, you pass on a drop of water out of the bucket full that God has already given you. From God's perspective, the distance between being ordinarily sinful as we are and extremely sinful as the people we don't like seem to be is the distance between London and South End as seen from the sun and so on and so on. But perhaps the key thing is not that we should simply swallow all resentment and forgive and forget as though nothing has happened. The key thing is perhaps that we should never ever give up making forgiveness and reconciliation our goal. If something needs to be dealt with and confronted to make that happen, as it often does, and we take the truth and reconciliation work in South Africa as a clear example, the truth comes with the reconciliation. You can't have the latter without the former. But that confrontation must always be with forgiveness in mind, never revenge. Oh, I could say that was always true for me. But let's dig into the parable a bit more for a few moments. A crisis of debt causes a problem and impacts the relationships between the rich and the poor in our age, just as it did in the first century. It's a reminder to us that debt is not just a matter of finance, but it's an aspect of human interaction which can lead to overbearing power for some and the loss of freedom for others. The parable starts then by asking the listeners to imagine a world where things are surprisingly different, where a mighty Lord would write off an incredibly large debt. Now the debt isn't just a metaphor for sin here and for God's people and for their life together. Forgiveness of one another would have had to have some sort of tangible expression like the release of debts. And one of the most liberating provisions of the Old Testament law was the year of Jubilee, where every 50 years property would be returned to its original owners in a bid to run against the grain of ever increasing concentration of land in the hands of a few. Now, as we know, and we've explored many times together, it's seldom the case that one can draw a straight line in Jesus' parables between the figure in charge and with power whether that's a king or a lord or the master and God. We're not supposed to work with the idea that the king in the story directly reflects God in every way, even if the story somehow reflects and represents something of how things work in God's kingdom. And that's certainly not how people hearing Jesus share this parable when he first spoke it would have heard it. This is one of only three stories of all the stories we have recorded Jesus having told that involves a king. And I suspect that was precisely to avoid too much of this direct linking. You see, the kings envisaged by the contemporary hearers of Jesus would have been far more like Herod, who along with other self-indulgent rulers like him, worked as puppets of Rome 
and had taken many of the people around them into virtual slavery by buying up all the farms and forcing them to work as tenants and then paying huge rents for the privilege of that. Anyway, the man in the parable cannot repay his debt to the king. And so he's then condemned to be sold along with his family and everything he owns. He then falls down before the king. He begs for patience. He would pay everything. Everyone listening to the story knows that this is pretty much impossible. It's too much. He can possibly pay it all back, but he's desperate and he's pleading, which to be fair, one can understand. You wouldn't expect cool negotiation in this sort of a moment. But he's casting himself on the mercy of the king. And then comes the first great surprise of the story. The king, we're told, is moved with compassion. There's a turning point here. The man is set free from his debt. The crowd would never have expected a king like the ones they've known to do that. The story isn't over though. And the next twist isn't a pleasant one. Remarkable forgiveness and mercy is followed in a few short moments by extraordinary vengeance by the one whose debt had been forgiven. And he takes the opposite approach with someone who owes a debt to him. Now the man who the king had forgiven had not been made rich, but his debt being forgiven had wiped the slate clean. His financial situation would still have been a tight one, but even so, his total lack of mercy and compassion leaves one wondering if he has forgotten what happened just moments before. Did he not make the connection? Had his powerlessness and pent up frustration led him? Uh, did he just have this need to kick out against someone? Did all the worrying about money make it harder for him to think clearly and to be the best version of himself? It's all possible, I suppose. We know that in times of economic stress, tight possessiveness and indeed violence are never far away. We've seen in this past year how domestic violence has increased and we need to be ready for how we will respond together to the angst and frustration that may come from the possible rise in unemployment when the furlough scheme ends in a few months time. These things have very real consequences. But having been told by some of the others about what had happened, we read that the king is thoroughly unimpressed. In fact, he's so angry that he consigns the man to a worse fate than either being sold to a stranger or being imprisoned for not paying a debt. It reads like a chilling end to the story, doesn't it? Where's the king's compassion now? It's one of the reasons why I think the king isn't to be taken too closely to representing God here. This fickle or changeable behaviour is far more like the kings of the day. Yes, he was moved to show mercy earlier, but that doesn't make him saintly or consistent. He seems to quickly regret his moment of vulnerability and generosity and reverts to type. I wonder what the king thought might happen when he forgave the man's debt. Could he have been hoping that his action would set off a chain reaction of forgiveness, spiralling down the layers of the social hierarchy, maybe? Perhaps he was keen in some small way to proclaim something of jubilee in the hope that it would catch on. If he was hoping to start a wave of mercy through his kingdom, he was going to have to be more consistent and patient and determined than one moment of mercy, however surprisingly lavish it was. But I think the last verse of our reading, verse 35, is a bit troubling. Why does Jesus say that those who refuse to forgive will themselves be refused forgiveness? Isn't that a bit harsh? Perhaps even out of step with the rest of the gospel? It's easier if we don't read the king as being God in the story. Uh, so this is a problem that's often been bigger for us than it would have been for Jesus' first listeners. But there is some comparison to be made. Jesus tells us that the warning in the parable applies to all of us who might nurture a possessive and demanding 
rather than a forgiving and releasing heart. Forgiveness is not so much a present given to someone regardless of their behaviour. It's more, it's more like the air in our lungs when there's only room for you to inhale the next lungful when you've breathed out the previous one. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Friends, if our hearts and minds are open and able to forgive and to be merciful, then they will also be open to receiving God's mercy and forgiveness. If you're still counting how many times you've forgiven someone, if we're still keeping score, then friends, that's just postponing vengeance. That's not embracing mercy. Jesus tells Peter here, don't even think about counting. And so what do we do with this parable in the context of Micah's challenge to us to be people who love mercy? It's a fine example of how not to make it a reality. But what do we do? I pray that the Holy Spirit will be at work in your life and in mine as we seek to join those dots together. But there are a few wonderings I have about it all though, and I'd like to finish by sharing them with you today. I wonder if loving mercy means being faithful to that calling forever and not having it play out in fits and starts. If mercy really is the first attribute of God, as Pope Francis writes, then might we work to make it a first attribute of us and our life together too? That means it has to be more than something we do occasionally. It'll mean being merciful time after time until it becomes our default response. And I wonder how we make sure to remember God's mercy towards us so that we can give thanks and praise to God for it, but also remember that some higher moral plane is not where we live, but that instead it's because of God's mercy that we're able to show that same kindness to others. And if this really is a time for mercy, I wonder how we might redouble our efforts to look for the wounded on the streets, gathering them in, embracing them, taking care of them, making them feel loved. Where might mercy be a blessing in your days and weeks ahead? I wonder where Jesus would go and what Jesus would do to demonstrate God's mercy in these days because that's where we ought to be. Friends, we want to love mercy so that we can help people see something of the face of God in this world. God is merciful and God will go on loving us back to life over and over and over again. For this and for so many other things, we say thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy.
And so, friends, may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the God of mercy and of kindness, be with you and those you love, today and always. Amen.